Hello and welcome. I'm Father Methodius, priest and rector of the Birth of the Baptist Church in Pinckney, Michigan. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Prasforka. I hope this small offering will sustain and give you strength to live a life of piety and purity. Several weeks ago, I began this series with the firm conviction that many of us who call ourselves Orthodox have little more than a superficial understanding of what Orthodoxy is and that our knowledge of how to practice it suffers from this underdeveloped view. During this series, I have risked offending people who may not be willing to accept all that I have said and who feel they know enough. If you have continued to follow along to this point, I can think of a couple reasons for doing so. One reason may be that you feel, like I feel, that you haven't made the kind of progress you should or could make, and that these talks have helped broaden your view a little. Another reason could be that you can't believe that I have the nerve to say some of the things I have said, and you're curious about what I will say next. Either way, I thank God that you are listening now. I know that even if I am a hypocrite, as long as I speak the truth, my listeners can be edified. Not only that, but by speaking the truth, I stand a chance at being edified as well. This fact is made clear in the latter. In this episode, Step 27, I will discuss what Climacus calls holy solitude of body and soul. St. John puts his definition of solitude right up front for us in the second article. He says, Solitude of the body is the knowledge and reduction to order of the habits and feelings. And solitude of soul is the knowledge of one's thoughts and an inviolable mind. He links this order of habits and feelings to watchfulness, a virtue I discussed in a previous episode. We may and often do think of Christian vigilance or watchfulness as guarding against bad thoughts. Bad thoughts, we think, come to us every now and again and must be guarded against. But, as we have discussed elsewhere, we don't know if our thoughts are good or bad, if they come from us or from demonic sources. So our watchfulness must be constant, and it must be occupied with guarding against all thought, as it is the unrelenting power of thought which keeps constant vigil at the doors of the heart and kills or repels the thoughts that come, says St. John. When it comes to the spiritual life, regardless of how long he has been orthodox, the practitioner of solitude must consider himself to be a beginner. Often those who have spent the most time in the church seem to be the least informed about the church's teachings and practices. I experienced just such an example when one Pascha night, a really sweet and pious Russian friend of mine rebuked me for including meats in my Pascha basket. She said, Never! We should never put meat in our baskets. To my mind, this seemed incongruous with the fact that I held in my hands at the time both the Krupilo and holy water basin and the Trebnik opened to the prayer entitled For the Blessing of Flesh Meats, which the priest was reading over our baskets. We just get stuck in these ruts along with our wrong ideas and end up living in error without even knowing it. St. John says, We are like bought serfs under contract to unholy passions. We therefore know to some extent the whims, ways, will, and wiles of the spirits that rule over our poor souls. But only to some extent, he says. We have a lot of work to do, and the work we should do begins with correct ideas. St. John says to the practitioner of solitude that the Psalter should be used in this process. He says reading it enlightens the mind considerably and helps it concentrate. In another place, I discussed the kinds of books that are very popular for modern Orthodox Christians. These are theological books that deal with complex theories 
so lofty as to require all attention without leaving any more energy for doing. While there are many very practical books that employ difficult theological words and notions, we do not suggest for a moment that big words render a book impractical. But there are also many books written in simplistic language that cunningly conceal wrong teachings. Books must be correct and practical because the body of Christ must live and move in space and time. We are Christians because we follow Christ. Because we compose his body, we are the church. And because Christianity as a term has grown to include cults, sects, and other religions, and because it is a theoretical system of beliefs more accurately called Christianism, we must adopt more careful language. We are the church. Practical books, though, including the scriptures, because they are written in a spirit of illumination, have the ability to inspire action. I recently learned that the way beauty is understood today can be traced back to the words used for beauty in earlier times by different peoples. Little comment need be made for what is called beautiful today. In our transhuman age, Beauty and ugliness mean the same thing. This should not surprise us because even as recently as the 1980s, it was said that when something was really good, it would be described as bad and so on. But for the Greeks, the words they used for beauty were practical, having to do with suitable function. With the Slavs, however, beauty had to do not with ugliness, as modern Americans prefer, and not with work properly done, as with the Hellenists, but with light, as in illumination. So beauty for the Slavs had to do with restraint, or praxis, which is the path to illumination. I think this way of understanding beauty has a great value for us today. If people ask me how I define beauty, always in my definition of beauty is this aspect of restraint. Practical teaching inspires action. Those who read practical books, the Psalter, the Ladder, and many others, benefit from this because, as the saint says, they attune those who attend to them. And he says, Let what you read lead you to action, for you are a doer. Putting these words into practice makes further reading superfluous. Seek to be enlightened by the words of salvation through your labors, and not merely from books. Do you see the beauty here? We read practical books and are inspired to do the works of God. Father Methodius, why do you want to limit us? Do you think we can't handle complex theological books, you may ask? I'm not saying that you can't handle them, but St. John does go this far. He says, Until you receive spiritual power, do not study works of an allegorical nature, because they are dark words, and they darken the weak. As I said recently, don't let your quest for meaning in life be an excuse to avoid your responsibilities. Just as this chapter warns the would-be solitary by saying, For all who are struggling with their clay, solitude is suitable at the right time if only they have a director. It also warns against taking refuge in reading books that are above our grade. The depth of the dogmas is profound, and the mind of the solitary does not caper among them without risk. Before we purify ourselves through Christian asceticism, theoretical books can become deadly for us. For as he says, it is not safe to swim in one's clothes, nor should a slave of passion touch theology. While those of us who live in the world cannot practice solitude in the same capacity as monastics, I have seen monastics who fail to practice it at all. The saint tells us that the solitary who has become lazy will tell lies, urging people by hints to end his solitude for him. And having left his cell, he blames the devils. 
he has not discovered that he is his own devil. But whether in the monastery or the world, there are techniques we can all benefit from. Shut the door of your cell to your body, says St. John. If we live in community, it is because God has placed us there for our salvation. This means that we should not cut ourselves off from our community, but we can cut ourselves off from the broader world to a degree. For this reason, in my own parish, we have been discussing and implementing ideas and practices that make us stand apart as a truly parallel society. Primarily, this is done by observing a full and active liturgical life. In order to do this, an amount of poverty must be assumed. Many people are unwilling to do this, but the cost for them in the long run will be a debt they cannot pay. Another way we can practice solitude is by speaking less. St. John says, close the door of your tongue to speech. As we observed, our lives are so dominated by chatter that to close this door periodically would be as difficult as it would be beneficial. One technique I try to use but that doesn't seem to bring about my desired outcome is when I'm having an argument with someone, which happens periodically with priests, I say to them, just be quiet. This method is unable to have its work because people here just shut up, which would also be beneficial. But what we cannot tolerate these days is to have anyone tell us to be quiet. Quiet, silence, solitude, and hesychasm are all related. If we cannot ever close the door of our tongue to speech, we will be our own judges. The last gate we should close is what the saint calls the inner gate to evil spirits. This inner gate is associated with pathologies. Pathologies in fallen man are conditioned by habituation, indoctrination, and ignorance. I do not say that pathologies are innate in man because we know, through the teaching of the scriptures and the Holy Fathers, that all human children born in the natural process are born with pure noose. And also the saints are free from pathologies because through the spiritual restraint of death to the self, they have become conscious of life in God, where perfect freedom is. The rest of us can be subject to evil spirits and their harmful influence. The inner gate is the noose, and it is shut when the mind enters the heart. This is an ascetical way of saying when the thought life is concentrated or isolated, and when feelings are produced not as a reaction to thoughts, but to the revelation of God. In this way, they are true feelings. When this process or order, to use the saint's word, is established, the thought life is subject to the spirit. And rather than bringing in data from the exterior world, which it interprets, it expresses the feelings it receives from the heart, packaging them in intelligible forms. This order is expressed in many ways. In one place, it is said that the rider, or the heart, is mounted upon the horse, the mind. In another place, it is said that a fountain of living water flows from the innermost man. In another place, it is described as scales having fallen from the eyes. And again, it is said that in his light, we see light. However we say it, though, unless through Christian asceticism the inner gate is shut to evil spirits, we will never be free from temptations. The patience of the sailor, says St. John, is tested in midday heat or when he is becalmed, and the lack of necessaries tries out the perseverance of the solitary. When the one gets discouraged, he swims in the water, and when the other gets despondent, he mixes with crowds. On a pastoral note, sometimes I hear from people that they need a break. They wonder what they are doing and what the point is to all this work we do, all this praying, all these church services. Because I am not advanced in sanctity, I somewhat understand this temptation. I get tired too. I try to tell them, though, that this is what the Christian life is, and that if they went to the monastery, they would simply get more of the same with more frequency and intensity. 
Even relatives used to ask, what are you doing when you spend all that time in church? As I often point out, prayer is not just saying prayers, and to pray is not simply to tell God what you want. St. Maximus, the confessor, says, It is said that the highest state of prayer is reached when the intellect goes beyond the flesh and the world, and while praying, is utterly free from matter and form. It takes time and practice to reach this level. For those who grow weary in well-doing, who feel like all they do is work and come to church, St. John says, When the watchman grows weary, he stands up and prays. And then he sits down again and courageously takes up his former task. Through some level of solitude and watchfulness, we should all take up your seat on a high place and watch, if only you know how, and then you will see in what manner, when, whence, how many, and what kind of thieves come to enter and steal your cluster of grapes. I often say that we must withdraw from the world so that we can work on ourselves. The solitary is one who runs away from all company, though without hatred. We leave the world to overcome its distractions. He who has attained to solitude has penetrated to the very depth of the mysteries, but he would never have descended into the deep unless he had first seen and heard the noise of the waves and the evil spirits, and perhaps even been splashed by these waves. If we leave the world, it is possible that, in learning to listen, the ear of the solitary will receive from God amazing words. That is why in the book of Job that all-wise man said, Will not my ear receive amazing things from him? Please take the time to read through this invaluable step. And please join me next time when I discuss step 28 on holy and blessed prayer, mother of virtues, and on the attitude of mind and body in prayer. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining me. Please remember to support us by spreading the word about genuine orthodoxy in Michigan. We appreciate also your financial support. To send donations through PayPal, please use fellowheirs at hotmail.com. Check out our website at Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church, no H at the end of church.com. Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church. Dot com. God bless you.